Well, this is certainly going to be the month for immersive sims with Atomic Heart, not to mention the System Shock remake slated for release in March. And since it's also about time for my yearly playthrough of Bioshock, I thought it might be worth going back and taking a look at one of the best that the Imsin genres ever produced. Look at the bright side. Maybe it'll be quick and painless. Ken Levine's spiritual successor to System Shock 2, taking you from the cold, dark reaches of space, and instead dropping you into the cold, dark reaches of the bottom of the ocean. It's the kind of game that would just never get made these days, especially by AAA devs, and also one that thankfully released before spoiler culture was enough of a thing that people would ruin all the fun. You got to remember that this thing came out in 2007, back at a time before YouTube was really as big as it was now, which meant that gameplay footage wasn't leaked and shared all over the place. And people who did have access to the game before or around launch weren't spoiling it on Twitter or 4chan either. So for a lot of people, myself included, we really went into this thing completely blind. Right from that opening where you're on that plane and then suddenly crashed in the middle of the ocean, it was an incredibly mysterious and captivating journey that you had no idea where it was going. Next thing you know, you've swam to a nearby abandoned lighthouse, you're taken to bathysphere hundreds of meters beneath the surface, as a welcome video by this bizarre looking entrepreneurial tyrant starts playing. I chose the impossible. I chose rapture. You surface inside this rundown and ruined hellhole, being attacked by a disfigured woman wielding fishing hooks, and your only ally is a mysterious man on the radio calling himself Atlas, who apparently wants to help you. I'm Atlas, and I aim to keep you alive. Bullshit! You find out that Rapture was this once great utopia run by a man called Andrew Ryan, with aspirations of making it this flourishing civilization. Only instead, they discovered a substance called Adam which could be used to rewrite someone's genetic code. So obviously the natural evolution of that discovery was to exploit children to harvest this substance. While all the other citizens just got blitzed on the stuff calling themselves splices, while a revolution between Ryan and the working class got to the breaking point that caused the collapse of the entire city. <laughs> yeah son, welcome to Rapture, the world's fastest growing pile of junk. But hey, it sure is a junk pile that's good looking. Yeah, Bioshock's one of those games that really shows that a good art style just trumps technological prowess. And playing it now in 2023 on a rig like mine, it's like looking back at a 1963 Aston Martin when you're driving a Ferrari. Outside of its unique art style, I think few games capture that feeling of claustrophobia so well, and the constant presence of water dripping from a broken window or a destroyed ceiling makes it feel like the ocean is a character of its own, constantly trying to get back in and claim the city back for itself. Seems like every single water effect you come across is different from the last, so it never seems like they're just copy-pasting the same trick over and over. It all runs on a heavily modified Unreal Engine 2.5, and while the Unreal Engine wasn't ever really known for intense lighting or shadows, at least compared to things like the It Tech 4 or the Crytek engine, they still make use here of dynamic shadows to great effect at some key moments throughout the campaign. What crawls, my God. Plus, I've always just loved that insane amount of environmental storytelling in the world as well. You rarely just enter a room where it seems like things are placed around randomly, and even a corpse tells its own story. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. This is all shown to great effect during the prologue, which has to be one of the best opening levels of all time. I mean, the detail in this area alone is just fucking ridiculous. During this bit here, for instance, if you wait around long enough, the rising water level is going to put out this nearby fire, which is something that is just completely unnecessary, but it shows the kind of detail and effort that they put into crafting this world. That's actually something that plays a big part in the gameplay too, is how different elements all affect each other. And within the span of the first 30 or so minutes, you're taught more or less everything you need to know for the remainder of the game. Now, the thing that eventually caused the ruination of Rapture was the invention of plasmids, which are more or less just superpowers that people shoot out of their hands. And your first introduction to this is with one early on called Electro Bolt. Oh. Daddy, now. Your genetic code is being rewritten. Early on, you're taught that zapping enemies while they're standing in water is a pretty easy way to kill them. And then, at the end of this first level, it tests you on that. During a sequence where you're ambushed by splices, and you may or may not notice they conveniently drop into the area and land in a small pool of water. And it's kind of like the teacher giving you a pop quiz at the end of the day to make sure you've been paying attention. I think... 
zapping cameras or turrets you also learn early on is a really easy way of being able to get near enough so you can hack into them and have them working for you. So you're given an ability here that you're really going to be using for the next 8 or 9 hours. But it also goes further than that and explains how Adam and the plasmids are harvested through the little sisters and the big daddies. Showing the full extent of the rage that comes with pissing one of those guys off. So you really know what you're getting yourself into when you inevitably have to fight one. Piss back your ears, bitch. Then of course it finally introduces you to Andrew Ryan, the guy who is responsible for this whole mess in the first place. Showing the height of his paranoia where he thinks you're some kind of agent sent in by the CIA or the KGB. Not to mention the music and the sound design pretty much across the board is just amazing. I mean the jingle from those Gatherer's Garden and Circus of Values vending machines are still living rent free in my head. Say the line, Bart! Come back when you get some money, buddy! <laughs> now, as I'm sure countless YouTube videos have covered in the past, Bioshock is obviously something of a spiritual sequel to System Shock 2, and even early on, it's pretty damn easy to see the similarities. Both begin with your character waking up essentially in the middle of nowhere. In System Shock 2, it's the Rick and Backer out in space, and in Bioshock, it's Rapture at the bottom of the ocean. Just like on the Rick and Backer 2, you've walked into this place after the events which have set this whole thing in motion. So it's like you're seeing this place at its absolute worst and then having to put the pieces together trying to find out what happened. Your starting weapon in both games is a wrench. Instead of psionic disciplines, you've now got plasmids. You see ghosts which replay events from the past and you're guided by a seemingly allied character who gives you your objectives and tells you where to go next. I know you must feel like the unluckiest man in the world right now. Get through a secure airlock before you're sucked into space. It's even got a pretty substantial plot twist about two thirds into the game, which completely changes up who the antagonist is. A twist though, which I'd argue is completely spoiled, even for people who haven't even played the game to begin with. I mean, it's got to be up there with people who already know what happens to Eris in Final Fantasy VII, or that Princess Peach is in another castle. The other thing too is that they've completely done away with other gameplay elements like the leveling up system and giving a player an actual inventory, which are just both completely gone now. Gotta say though, I don't really see the issue with that, considering you still level up in other ways and the absence of this Windows 95 era interface to sort out every little item you come across just wasn't all that necessary anyway. It just kind of feels like they've streamlined these features and kept what they needed to be kept for the sake of making the gameplay just flow a little bit better. So I guess my point is that I don't really agree with that old sentiment from the time of the game's release where people were saying that the whole thing was dumbed down and it's kind of like saying that playing Beethoven's fifth isn't as impressive on a trumpet as it is on a piano. In fact, I even think that the splices in Bioshock as this main enemy faction are more memorable in some ways than the enemies in System Shock 2. Like the hybrids in System Shock 2, they just kind of shuffled around murmuring things to themselves, which was fine. I mean, it suited the whole premise of them being these hapless humans taken over by an alien parasite. The splices, on the other hand, are much more vocal, rambling and speaking borderline gibberish. And it just shows off way more personality, not to mention giving you this subtle window into what kind of people they might have been before shit hit the fan. Come on! I just want to talk to somebody! One of the most interesting mechanics though in Bioshock is the little sisters and the big daddies. Now this was something that they heavily marketed before the game launched and it's kind of hard to ignore how captivating the premise was of this cute little monster girl being escorted around this dilapidated hellhole by a freak living inside a diving costume who's got a drill for an arm. The explanation behind what's going on here is that the sisters are sent throughout the city to harvest Adam from the corpses of Rapture's former citizens and the big daddies are also sent after them to protect them. Adam is the reason why everyone is so blitzed out of their mind, and it's kind of like imagine if you could harvest meth from sea slugs, and yeah, it's kind of the idea. But it's also what the player has to use to buy new upgrades and abilities, and the only way to get to this stuff is by taking out the big daddies, which is easier said than done. Gotcha, bitch. The first big daddies you fight are those guys with the drill arms, and they move around really quickly and can more or less knock your entire health bar off in a single hit. Thankfully though, Bioshock has this really good mechanic where instead of being killed instantly, you're instead dropped to near death. Then you've got like a second or so to use a health kit before a follow-up attack is going to finish you off. And it's a simple mechanic, but it removes what would have been lots of frustrating deaths. 
Comes in really handy during these big daddy fights because the more elite variants that you fight later on, including the Rosies who carry around what's more or less like a nail gun on steroids, can knock your health off even faster. Beating these guys is going to be as easy or hard as you want to make it to be though, and if all you do is just shoot them with your standard weapons, well, then yeah, you're going to have a bad time. Either way, once you've finally killed one of these assholes, you're then free to either harvest or rescue that little sister they were protecting, and this shows off the tacked on moral system that Bioshock introduces. Thank you. Now, I say tacked on because it's more or less just a bit of a black and white decision. I mean, you're either going to be an absolute boy scout and save these girls from a lifetime of servitude collecting sea muck from corpses, or on the other hand, you'll just murder them like a fucking psychopath, pulling out that giant sentient sea turd from their insides. Without a doubt though, the best choice is to spare them, because although it doesn't seem like it at first, after every three sisters you rescue, a lady called Dr. Tenenbaum, who's more or less their caretaker, sends you a care package at the nearest gatherer's garden, which not only comes with an extra 200 atom, but also sometimes plasmids you can't find anywhere else. Later on in the game, you'll also reach the hideout, where all these little sisters are, well, hiding, and seeing all of them just doing what little kids do. That's mine. Not to mention hearing their admiration towards the player really makes you feel like you're having a positive impact on the world itself. There he is! The one who will save us all. And that right there, man, that's something that's essential for a game that's got that immersive sim tag. Mama Tenenbaum said he'll help us. Regardless of which choice you go with, though, it's all about getting that sweet, sweet Adam and buying new plasmids and tonics. <laughs> first you're pretty damn weak, but by the end of the game you become really formidable, and ironically just as messed up as the splices you're going up against. You really do feel like a bit of a junkie, in fact the way you recharge your plasmid energy is by jabbing up with these syringes, shoving these things into your arm like a complete savage with an animation that was created by someone who, I can only imagine, has never had to self inject in real life. Combat is almost entirely against the Splicers, Rapture's former citizens who spent a bit too much time doing bags of Adam and have now gone completely insane. And there's a few variants you gotta deal with. You've got Thuggish, Leadhead, Spider, Nitro, and Houdinis. Thuggish and Spider Splicers use melee attacks, Leadheads use the pistol or the Tommy gun, Nitros walk around and throw grenades, and Houdinis teleport in and out, shooting off fireballs. Hello! They all show off some pretty basic intelligence, staying mobile so they're more than just easy targets, and even running away and trying to use nearby healing stations if they're low on health. Hi. Weapons include a wrench, a revolver, shotgun, tommy gun, grenade launcher, crossbow, and a chemical thrower. And one of my favourite parts about this game has always been upgrading these weapons and seeing them updated visually in real time, with all these makeshift components added on like they've been pulled out of a nearby dumpster. Mechanically though, Bioshock ain't the best shooter, and the gunplay does feel kinda floaty. That's gonna be doubly so too if you try to play this as a straight up first person shooter, but I have to say, if you do that, that is the incorrect way to play the game because the combat is all about utilizing all the various plasmids in conjunction with your weapons. Bioshock's combat is never just about shooting someone. I mean, yeah, you can play it that way if you really want to, but it just feels like it's been intended to be more about shooting someone in combination with a plasmid. That's why swapping back and forth between plasmids and weapons is as simple as right-clicking on the mouse. You're encouraged to do that, and the game doesn't dick you around in that regard. They teach you really early on about that Electro Bolt and the Wrench combo, the one-two punch, where you zap someone to stun them and then finish them off with a hit from the wrench. And this is a basic tactic which is effective throughout the entire game. In fact, there's even melee builds you can go for here which make the wrench a really effective weapon, even late game. Even the simple combo of hitting someone with Incinerate, which lights them on fire, is going to do damage over time, while you can then also add to that by shooting them with another weapon. Incinerate's also got some pretty clever integrations into the environment, like being able to melt blocks of ice to find items or get through blocked doors. One of the most effective things to do is light someone on fire, forcing them to put themselves out in a nearby pool of water, which you can then also zap with the Electro Bolt for an easy kill. Yeah, that shit never gets old.
Winter Blast is more or less the same idea as Electro Bolt, only instead of stunning enemies with lightning, it freezes them entirely. Now this one is more effective than Electro Bolt, but the dilemma is that if you kill someone when they're frozen like a TV dinner, then they shatter into like a million pieces and they can't be looted. So it's like a bit of a catch-22 there of getting a quick and easy kill, but missing out on those important items that they're going to leave behind. It's also got a secondary function though, like being able to freeze cameras and turrets to make them easier to hack, so really does a plasma just exist for a single use? Some of the most useful plasmids aren't even those of early offensive ones, like telekinesis. Because it seems after Half-Life 2 that every single game had to have an ability or a weapon that showed off the physics engine. Anyway, this one allows you to pick up almost any object and throw it at enemies, ideally something like an explosive barrel or a propane tank. For the Nitro Splicers, you can catch their bombs in midair and even launch it back at them, and if you're quick enough, you can catch Houdini projectiles as well. But then you can also use it to grab items that are out of reach. Target Dummy is also arguably one of the best ones in the game too, and this thing doesn't do anything aside from just putting out a decoy that distracts all nearby enemies. Now these are both really good for two main reasons. Firstly, they're cheap to cast using bugger all at them, but secondly, you don't need to upgrade them. Most of the other plasmids in the game need upgrades to keep them effective, which get increasingly more expensive, but these two are good as gold from the get-go and they never stop being useful. In fact, you know what? I'll do you one further. If you're not playing Bioshock with at least one of these active all the time, well, then you're playing the game wrong. Now, to make the whole thing even more confusing, you've got to take into consideration all the tonics. Yeah, dog, passive buffs to give you bonuses on top of everything else like making the hacking minigame a little bit easier, giving you more resistance to damage, or one of my favorites, which I'll get into a bit later, being able to swing the wrench faster and harder. Now there are plasmas that are less useful and more situational, like Insect Swarm is one of the plasmids I've just never gotten the hang of, and about all this thing seems to do is inconsistently distract enemies with wasps so you can then shoot them. Remember before how I said plasmids rarely exist for a single use? Yeah, well, this one is the exception to the rule. Seemed interesting when they showed it off in all those old trailers, and playing as an alt version of the pain from Metal Gear Solid 3 is kinda cool, <laughs> but it's just a bit of a gimmick that loses its novelty really quickly. And I often just save my Atom and that plasmid slot for something else entirely. Security Bullseye is another one. Now, this one makes security systems attack splices, whereas usually it just ignores them. And again, there is a bit of a novelty to this, but it's just never consistently useful. I mean, if you go around hacking all the cameras and turrets, which you should be doing anyway, you're basically just getting that same benefit. Hypnotize Big Daddy does exactly what it sounds like. Having a Big Daddy follow you around for a while to help out, but this one again is also pretty crappy. Because not only does it use up an entire atom bar to convert one, which early on in the game can be kind of costly, but then once you've got one of these lead-footed lugs on your side, it's like they've converted to fucking Buddhism or something, and they turn into complete pacifists and rarely engage in combat. The other plasmid is Cyclone Trap, which puts out a mini tornado on the floor that launches enemies up into the air, and this one is just bogus. Because even if you launch someone to the kind of height that realistically should turn them into a pancake by the time they hit that pavement, they often still survive and just hop right back up. So, yeah, explain that one. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Either way, though, it plays its role in distracting or incapacitating an enemy long enough to give you an advantage, and that's what the whole combat system's really about. It's never just about zapping someone to death or Sonic booming them to death. In the same way, it's not about emptying entire magazines of the Tommy gun into someone until they go down. And yes, look, you're free to play the game that way if you really want to. That's your right. Much in the same way that if you choose to play the game that way, well, then I've got the right to mock and ridicule you if you've still got the gumption to criticize the combat. I actually think the standard bullets are just put in there to mess with the player, and the Altman ammo types are really what you're supposed to be using. The you invent stations and machine where you can turn bits of scrap you come across into spare ammo, and pretty much everything you craft here are those more powerful ammo variants. You'll notice splices are pretty resilient to pistol and tommy gun rounds, but change over to anti-personnel rounds and they'll go down in a matter of hits. 
lot of people give shit to Doom 3 shotgun for being useless at anything but point blank range, and it's always kind of funny to me how Bioshock shotguns got a free pass in that regard, because this thing is more or less the same, in fact it's probably even worse. The difference though is that Bioshock shotgun comes with electric and explosive buckshot, and once you start loading those bad boys in, well, you're gonna have a hell of a time. You a man? <laughs> electric buck even stuns enemies when they're hit, so yeah, imagine how handy that's gonna be against the big daddies. Kinda gets to the point where I don't even really bother using the standard rounds for weapons, outside of maybe things like the crossbow and the grenade launcher, because those alternate ammo times are just that much better. I'll never get sick of laying traps with the crossbow, and even now replaying through it for this video, I've still figured out some new tricks. Like I've only just realized after this last playthrough that you can use the chemical gun to freeze turrets and cameras. Yeah, shit. When I see people saying that the enemies are damage sponges, it really just makes me realize that they're not using all the tools the game's given them. I mean, look, let's be clear though, the enemies in this game are sponges, but that's only if you're not making use of one of the game's most important mechanics, the research camera. Early on in the game, you come across an old stills camera, the kind of thing that first year art school students get their hands on and suddenly think they're Martin Scorsese. Anyway, from that point on, you can take photos of pretty much every enemy type in the game. And after a certain amount of photographs are taken, you can start earning some pretty useful buffs. From just doing more damage against that particular enemy, to even unlocking secret tonics. One of these tonics even lets you turn invisible if you stand still for long enough. But if you don't spend any time photographing that splicer type, well, chances are you're going to miss it entirely. Where it starts to get really interesting is when you come across a tonic that also increases the bonus you get from the research, which obviously stacks on top of whatever you've already unlocked. Even just having the damage you deal against splices buffed up two or three times gives you a huge advantage. And late game, once you got weapons like the crossbow, you really can deal with most splices with complete ease, even on hard mode. Even the big daddies, which are kinda tough initially, just become laughably easy once you've researched them a bit and start using your better ammo times. I mean with the chemical thrower, if you're using the electric gel, you can essentially just stun lock them the entire time. Yep, that's me. So yeah, when I see people saying the combat sucks and enemies are spongy, because they take a bazillion shotgun rounds or an entire magazine from the Tommy gun, well, all I can do is kind of shake my head at that. Shut up! Because it's kind of obvious to me that those people have glossed over an entire fucking subsystem of mechanics that would have alleviated that complaint entirely. It's a combat system you can really learn to abuse and exploit, which, in my opinion, is entirely what you're meant to be doing. So, yeah man, why not abuse it? Now, the absolute apex of the Bioshock experience comes roughly halfway into the game with Fort Frolic, which is one of, if not the single best level in any first person shooter. I mean, this thing's up there with surface tension in Half-Life and the Siberia level from Time Splitters 2. Fort Frolic is set in essentially Rapture's entertainment hub, which is kind of ironic because this whole level just feels like a playground. It's the ultimate sandbox for the play to mess around in. Welcome to Fort Frolic. And at this point in the story, you've more or less unlocked every weapon in Plasmid. No. Also, for the only time in the entire game, you don't have to worry about carrying out orders for Atlas or trying to figure out how to catch up to Andrew Ryan. So say goodbye to those two blowhards and hello to an evening with Sander Cohen. You dropped into this area controlled by this aging artist named Sander Cohen and able to do things at your own speed. Sander Cohen's also one of the more memorable characters you interact with. He's kind of like Bioshock's answer to Gloria Swanson from Sunset Boulevard. Unbelievable. Sander tasks you with helping him finish his masterpiece, a grisly tableau where you need to take photos of Cohen's former protégés after you've killed them, then compile these photos on this giant mural in the atrium. It's coming together. And because all these folks aren't obviously too keen on the idea of being memorialized as photographed corpses, well, you're gonna need to find and kill them first. But outside of that one lingering objective, there's like a whole precinct of the city to explore at your own pace. And this is one of the many times in the game where if you go off the beaten path, you're gonna be rewarded for your troubles. It's also the only time I think in the entire game where you hear Bobby Darren's Beyond the Sea playing on a jukebox, a song that works so well in that original trailer that the person who thought it up honestly deserves an award. 
You get glimpses into Cohen's fractured mental state from clues left behind in his audio logs, and the corpses of his previous victims kind of show what happens when a mind like his is essentially trapped in this place where he can't possibly escape. I mean, the guy's basically a serial killer, leaving his victims in these grotesque poses covered in plaster as he's turned them into these eternal monuments to his insanity. Not to mention, there's just some really creepy rooms here. One where the play is even ambushed by splices posing as statues. It's just a level that feels entirely out of left field, and for a game which is already in an entirely different ballpark, well, that's really saying something. Oh, I've got a pose all picked out for you. But then it also still has elements that connect you to the main story, and it's some pretty damn big ones. <laughs> If you end up leaving Cohen alive when the whole thing comes to an end, you can even run into him later at his apartment later down the track, which has its own optional encounter. Where if you want to, you can finally put this sick fuck out of commission for good. When people try to tell me Bioshock's boring or unexciting, well, I can only guess that they didn't make it to Fort Frolic. Because this is like the level to me where all of the pieces finally come together, and I think I only replay this game so I can play through it again. It's... It's... Beautiful. The only issue is that shortly after this, things do start to feel a bit anticlimactic. Now look, I don't think Bioshock is immune to criticism, and despite the word masterpiece getting thrown around a lot when describing it, which let's be honest is a pretty accurate word, there are still faults here and there. Pacing wise, after that plot twist about two thirds in, it does kind of feel like the whole thing loses momentum, at least up until the last couple of eras in that final boss encounter. That's kind of the downside to dropping this giant narrative bomb when the player still has like another four or five hours to get through. It'd be like Darth Vader telling Luke that he's his old man when they're still fighting on Hoth. Oh, sorry, spoilers. One of the things which I even noticed the first time I played it was the repetition of character models and how there's just not that much variety to all of the splices. I mean, Atlas, for instance, the few times you see him is just really one of those generic fishery splices. And I guess that they thought because you only see him from a distance and very briefly that no one would notice. Well, guess what? We did notice. Same thing with Julie Langford and later Dr. Tenenbaum when you finally meet her. For both of these ladies, it's that same looking crazy female splicer. You're nothing. You're <laughs> also, all of the little sisters are the exact same too, just with different hair colors. There he is. And yeah, look, I know you can't expect them to have dozens of unique models, but using the same one for a friendly ally that you've seen countless times as an enemy just kind of comes off as lazy. No, please! But without a doubt, the crappiest element to Bioshock's gameplay, and the one that just keeps getting worse over time, is the way they've integrated the research camera and hacking. Now look, the research camera is solid in principle, and I think it's a necessary evil to not get completely overwhelmed by the enemies, but constantly having to snap photos of splices can be really disruptive to the overall combat flow. The hacking is that little mini game where you've got to move around pipes and direct a flow to an exit point, whilst avoiding overload and alarm tiles to try to take control of cameras, turrets, or hacking into safes and locked doors. And again, it is kind of solid in principle, but you'll notice how poorly thought out the whole thing is when you've got to hack like two or three machines in quick succession, because again, it really just does disrupt the flow of the gameplay. Not to mention it magically pauses the world around you while you're doing it. Yeah, I guess everyone's just nice enough to stand around and not attack you while you're trying to hack into stuff. Both of these ideas should have just never made it past the drawing board, but I think I'm just so used to them by this point that I kind of overlook how dumb they are. It's kind of like if you drive in rush hour traffic for long enough, you know, eventually you just kind of get numb to it and accept it for what it is. Well, that's kind of how I feel with both of these mechanics. I mean, they're not entirely bad, but yeah, they could be better. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is, is that these were actually some of the many things that Bioshock 2 would improve upon. Adding in things like real-time hacking, which is much faster, along with a full motion camera as opposed to stills. In Bioshock 2, the hacking tool is also remote, so you're not breaking the laws of nature anymore, it's somehow floating in the air magically while you hack into these things either. As for researching enemies, well, the addition of a film camera that records over time means you don't have to span that shutter a bazillion times. You just start this thing rolling while you're in combat, have those splices do their thing on the casting couch, and then learn all their weaknesses. It's actually kind of funny too how Bioshock foreshadowed what Bioshock 2 would eventually do. I mean, the final couple levels in the first game was where you turn yourself into a big daddy, but then with the sequel, they've made an entire game where you're playing as one. I'm telling the other girl that I have the best daddy. FBI, open up! 
prototype anyway, named Subject Delta, awakening 10 years after the events in the first game to find the place has turned into even more of a shithole. <laughs> then having a journey across Rapture to find your so-called daughter so your heart doesn't shut down. Yikes. Seeing as Andrew Ryan got the Last of Us 2 treatment and got himself a lobotomy with a golf club, the new reigning antagonist is a woman named Sophia Lamb, leading a bizarre cult called The Family, and her daughter, Eleanor, just happens to be that former little sister that you're searching for. As a result, there's way more of a focus on the backstory behind the little sisters this time, and considering you're also playing as a big daddy, you even get to carry these girls around on your back and drop them at corpses to harvest Adam, having to defend them from incoming splices along the way. This means you end up flush with Adam pretty quickly, and then there's even a tonic which compounds the Adam you get from those sisters even further. So it gets to the point where I just started buying stuff for the sake of it. Daddy, are you taking me home too? Along with having to take on other big daddies to win over their affection, you've also got to fight the even tougher bigger sisters, which are admittedly kind of hitting the shallow end of the creative pool, and as you'd expect, they're even stronger than the big daddies. The backstory there is that these are former little sisters who've now gone batshit crazy and apparently hopping into a diving suit seemed to be the best idea at the time. If that's not enough, they're also supposed to be about 7 foot tall, then look, I'm all for women that are physically superior and can beat the shit out of me, but even this might be taking it a bit too far. I think the way they introduced these characters is really cool though, with one big sister in particular going full stage 5 clinger and hunting subject Delta throughout the entire prologue. At one point, this psychopathic bitch even destroys a window, causing the sea to rush in and flood the area, which also highlights one of the new features, being able to stomp across the ocean floor in your pheromone soaked diving suit. On that note too, visually, Bioshock 2 is just a cut above the first game, I think, in every way. With even more gorgeous visual effects, improved lighting that even includes player shadows, and more Art Deco-inspired locations to rummage through. I like that they've tried to differentiate it from the first game, and you do get a sense that this is Rapture 10 years after you last saw it, with algae and barnacles covering lots of surfaces, showing the decay that's happened over time. And some of these areas just look amazing. Like, I really love that first reveal shot when you see Rapture again, and the way that water goes across your helmet just looks gorgeous. There's way more variety now to the character models, like Tenenbaum for instance returns early on here and she even has her very own unique appearance, where she really looks like she just needs a good hug. As for the gameplay, well the best way I'd describe it is it's like they've looked at every aspect of the first game that was a bit lacking and just tried to find a way to make the whole thing work better. There's that old saying, if it ain't broke don't fix it, which is true, but hey that doesn't mean you still can't grease up the wheels a little bit. So Bioshock 2 right off the bat adds in dual wielding, plasmids in one hand and weapons in the other, completely removing the need to swap back and forth between during combat. The weapons more or less follow the same archetypes as the first game, the rivet gun is basically a revolver or a pistol, the machine gun is the tommy gun, the shotgun and the nade launcher are, you know, well a shotgun and a nade launcher, and then the spear gun is more or less the crossbow. The real new inclusion is the drill arm instead of a wrench, and with this thing not only can you drill into enemies, which looks awesome, but also smash into them with a drill charge. A move that most people who took on big daddies in the first game probably have PTSD over. Dancing, They've also toned down the amount of medkits and syringes you can carry from 10 to 5, and this also makes the combat way more challenging, and means you can't just half arse your way through the whole thing. To compensate for that, you're given three starting plasmid slots instead of two, and all of the tonics are now just lumped into a single category, so you can make some truly broken builds. Definitely feels like a bit of an experience catered towards people who'd gotten really good at the first game, because the hard mode here is way more punishing, and you die even easier than before. Which is kind of odd though, considering you're supposed to be this underwater version of Frankenstein's monster, and yet you get dropped faster than your mum's panties at a frat house party. I'm sure if I really spent more time analysing the whole thing, I could show how it's a super unbalanced game. Which it is. Which it is. But eventually it kind of gets to the point where it just doesn't really matter, because you've got so much cash and enough ammo, plasmids and tonics that you can just mitigate all of that stuff. And look, I'm not going to mark a game down for being more challenging, but yeah, this is a hard mode that's worthy of its namesake, and it does not fuck around. So like the first game, get that decoy plasmid as soon as you can and never look back. Overall though, it's still a pretty damn good game. And I do prefer those updated gameplay elements to the first one, especially the hacking and the research camera. Still though, you can't help but get a bit of a been there done that feeling when playing through it. It even has the same opening sequence where you get Electro Bolt for the first time. You 
Your genetic code is being rewritten. Then the second area has you finding a fire plasma to progress. And then in the third level, you've got to get the camera for the first time. So it does feel like it's just marching to a beat that you've already danced to. There's one of those big goons now. Start your camera rolling on him and then let him have it. Now get me some snap snaps on those spider spicers. There's always been lots of discussions over which game is better. And while I like them both for different reasons, there was something so unique and kind of magical about the first game that I just don't think that Bioshock 2 can ever beat it. Still though, it hits those emotional highs and lows and the so-called good ending is one of the few times, along with Metal Gear Solid 3 and The Darkness 2, where a video game has actually made me cry. Full on cry too, like a basic bitch. What are you doing, you're crying? No! When you finally get to that ending, after having made some pretty tough moral choices along the way, you know, outside of just choosing whether or not to murder little girls, well, this is a game that's gonna leave you feeling emotionally wrecked. Just let me live! So if you're wondering whether or not it's worth playing along with the first game, well, then that's an easy yes from me. All right. Just get yourself together. I don't know if I can be friends with you anymore after this display. Go, shut up! As for which version of the game to play, well, damn, son, that's opening up an all-new can of worms. You see, in 2016, we got the Bioshock Collection, with both games getting remastered and updated for the at-the-time modern platforms. In my experience, the original version is more or less stable. It just has a lot of issues. For instance, there's a sound glitch, which has been prevalent for, I think, as long as I've ever played the game, where sounds don't get played properly and seem to cut each other off. You also need to play around a bit to change the FOV, which is really low by default, and you've also got to contend with general compatibility problems as well. The remasters fix this kind of stuff, but then it also messes up other things, like needlessly changing certain textures around and also removing certain enemy behaviors in tiling. The best example of the texture change is right in the opening when you arrive at the lighthouse. I mean, in the original, you can clearly see the steps are wet, cold, and slippery, but then in the remaster, the whole thing just looks completely flat and it's lacking any kind of surface detail in tiling. And why they thought that opening sequence needed more seaweed is anyone's guess. As for the enemy behaviors, well, remember before how I said my favorite thing was lighting someone on fire, then watching them jump into nearby water to put themselves out? Yeah, well, I guess they forgot to add that into the remaster or something because that tactic no longer works. You light someone on fire and they just stand there and burn to death, you know, despite a pool of water being readily available and within arm's reach. These aren't entirely game-breaking changes and it's not an entirely bad way to play the game, but I would still say that if you can be bothered to get the whole thing working properly, well, the original's still your best option. I mean, the remasters weren't even handled by Irrational Games. They handed it off to some company called Blind Squirrel Games, and that may be the most suitable name of all time because I sure think someone at that company was fucking blind if they released these remasters with all these problems. Maybe in the future I'll go back and take a look at Bioshock Infinite, but I feel like bringing that game up in this video is like throwing a firecracker into a turd-filled toilet bowl. I mean, all that's going to do is blow things up and throw shit everywhere. <laughs> Besides, I mean, Bioshock Infinite just feels so different from 1 and 2. There's like a seamless transition between both these first two games, and you can almost play them back to back in one cohesive, seamless experience. And that's really how I feel about the first game overall. It's so cohesive and seamless. It's why I always end up replaying it at least once a year, and every time I go back, I'm reminded why it was so amazing to begin with. There's been talks of Ken Levine working on a new Shock game for years now, and we might even be talking about it sooner than we know, but for the time being, the first Bioshock, I think, stands the test of time. As a truly balls-to-the-wall artistic gameplay experience, where you zap drug addicts with lightning bolts and shoot them in the face with explosive soup tins. So on the off chance you've still not played it, would you kindly rectify that as soon as possible? So, better luck next time. Now, go.